Alrighty then. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, we want to take you back in time to a time when dragons ruled the land and we've got a problem. So the Iron Bank is going bust. Someone has been conning them out of cash. They've been um, stealing all their money somehow. So they've asked us to come in and help solve the problem, figure out who the criminals are. So what we're going to do is apply some modern techniques to a problem that existed basically as long as we've had money, pretty much. The problem of looking for fraudulent transactions. So we're going to do that with a combination of SQL and machine learning. So I'm going to obviously, fairly obviously, hopefully, take the SQL side. So I'm Chris Saxon. I'm part of Stephen Feuerstein's Oracle Developer Advocate team. It's my job to help you get the best out of Oracle Database and hopefully have a bit of fun whilst doing so. And to help me with the machine learning, I've got Abby. <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, so I'm Abby giles Haig. I'm the Chief Data Science Officer at Bertice, um, and I'm help here to help Chris when he gets stuck in the SQL world and bring him out into the ML world. Ah, stuck in the SQL world? Ah, well, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how it goes, right? <laughs> yeah. okay, Come on, then. Then. okay, so um, the Iron Bank, they've got the big list of all their transactions and what they've done is they've identified some which are fraudulent and they've got this big big book of them and they've handed them all over to the hand of the king and said to them and say look we've got all these fraudulent transactions figure out what the common causes are see if you can identify some common rules we can apply so when a new transaction comes in um, we can say flag it up and say this is fraud or it's probably fraud we want to look into it so they pour through all these vast tomes of pages and pages of transactions and they find um, a couple of kind of common situations for these fraudulent transactions. So the first up is pretty straightforward. There are a lot of transactions with a value of exactly 10 million, right? And a lot of these have turned out to be a bit fishy. I mean, it tends to be a bit fishy when you have lots of transactions for a very exact value. Usually there's, you know, some number of nines um, or some pence or cents at the end. But we've got a lot of these and a lot of them turn out to be fishy. So we want to pull out all transactions with a value of 10 million. Pretty straightforward. Second one is a little bit more interesting. We've got a scenario where people are trying to pass money, dirty money around their house to try and clean it. Um, so what they've done, um, we've received some dodgy money, transferring it to others around the house and um, eventually cash it out again. So I'll, I'll explain in a bit more detail how, what this really means in a few minutes. So how are we going to investigate this? Well, we've got our transactions table, um, unsurprisingly, and it's got the regular transaction details you would in that, have in there. So things like the date, the amount, the account, and so on. Now, to help us um, apply the rules, see if there's any nuances, and also to help the machine learning try and figure out what else is going on there, we're going to augment this with extra information about the sender and receiver account. So not only do we have the account information, but who it is, you know, which house they're from, estimate of their income, that kind of thing. See if we can find common causes for them. So we got that for the sender, also got it for the receiver. And that means we end up with a table that looks a bit like this. So we've got our transaction dates, um, amounts, and so on. And we've got um, about 100,000, a little over 100,000 of these transactions. And we want to apply the rules to them. So the first rule, Look for transactions with a value of exactly 10 million. Nice and easy. What do we do? We just add a where clause, right? It's pretty straightforward. We all know how to do this, right, Abby? <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah, that's, that's, even I've got that one, Chris. I'm sorry about yeah, that. Exactly. One. Day one of SQL, this is, isn't it? All right. <laughs> now, the second one is a little bit more interesting. So, um, as I said, I'll explain what I mean by this to start off with. So, in this instance, we are looking for a very simple chain here. I've got some dodgy money. Um, I pay it in to my account. I then transfer it over to Abby, um, who then cashes it out. And the, the idea here is that you know I've got some ill-gotten gains from somewhere, and hopefully in this transfer transfer we make it clean, um, and so the bank won't realise what's actually going on here. Um, now, do remember we're back in ancient times where we didn't have computers to do this kind of analysis. 
then you might have got away with it. These days, you'd need to be a lot more sophisticated. In reality, if people were going to try this today, they would do something a bit more like this. So I'd get my dodgy cash, so I've got a thousand euros I want to clean, and then I'll pass it to all the hundred of you sitting there watching this. I'll pass it on to um, the first person, to Sabina, who will pass it on to the next person, next person, next person, next person, so on and so forth. So eventually it gets over to Abby, and oh. she, will, she will then cash it out. Um, the idea being here is we just make this chain so long that the bank can't spot what's going on here. Um, now, it is actually possible for us to kind of sort of guess this using SQL. And of course, if you've got a large sum of money working its way through the system, the bank's probably going to spot that too. Um, so this isn't the best way to do it. Well, I'm, I'm not sure what the best way to do fraud is, really. You know? I don't know about you, Abby. But... No. <laughs> uh, or if I did, I probably wouldn't admit it anyway, right? Um, but uh, what some people are doing are increasingly something a bit like this. So if I've got one lump of money and I want to transfer it to Abby to kind of clean it, if I'm passing that through all of you watching this, there's a lot of risk going on there. First up, it's easy for the bank to spot this large sum of money moving around. But secondly, any of you watching this, it might any time go, well, hang on, we're not, we'll are not. we just take the money for ourselves, right? We're not going to complete the chain and end up with it get to Abby at the end. So, yeah, we don't want that, do we? We want, we want no. to keep the money for ourselves. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So um, instead of... Uh, passing this whole amount, what we'll do is we've got, let's say a thousand euros, that's a hundred people, divide it equally. So I'll give 10 euros to each of you and then ask each of you to forward that 10 euros then on to Abby. Much trickier to spot because 10 euros is a more kind of routine transaction value. Also, if any of you decide you're gonna defect, not play ball, well, we've only lost like 10 euros rather than the full 10,000. So this is actually um, much harder to spot with SQL. Um, there are techniques you can do it, but that's outside the scope of what we're doing to talk about today. So, simple scenario. Keep with a simple scenario. I've got some money. I'm going to transfer it to Abby. She's going to cash it out. So, we are going to look and see if there are has been another transaction recently of exactly the same value within a house. So, first thing we want to do is limit it to just cash and transfer type transactions. We don't want to care about purchases, things like that, just transfers and cashes in and out. And to find whether or not there's been a recent transaction of the same value, we're going to do this, this max transaction ID. Um, and this allows us to see, has there been another transaction of exactly the same value within a house? And if that's not null, we say it's fraud, right? Um, so how do we do that? check it by house. Well, we'll partition it up by sender and receiver house and the transaction value. So let's imagine we're all in house Oracle, for example. Um, every transaction we make between each other, transferring cash um, of exactly the same value will fall in one bucket. So we can see every transaction uh, for one euro, 10 euro, 100 euro, 1000 euro, so on and so forth. Group them all together. And of course, there's like a time component to this we get some money and then it has to flow its way through the accounts so we need to sort it by date and by default if that's all we do then what this does is it processes the range between unbrounded proceeding and current row so what does that mean well it means consider every single transaction for all of history and the current row Two problems here, right? Two problems. <laughs> Doesn't sound right, does it, Abby? <laughs> no, that really does not sound right, Chris. You've got something exactly. wrong there. Exactly. So, um, first of all, we're including the tran current transaction in the thing. So, the maximum including the current transaction, well, at worst case, we're always going to return the current row, okay? Even if there is no other transactions, the same value. So, we need to exclude the current transaction for this. But, of course, also, we don't want to go back over all of history. If you've got 10, 20, 30, maybe even more years worth of history of transactions, the chances of there being two or more transactions of the same value rapidly approaches one. It becomes almost certain that at some point in the past, someone has transferred a thousand euros from um, within House Oracle just perfectly, normally, and legitimately. So we don't want to do that. We want to bound this. We want to set a time 
frame in the past, how far back we want to look, and exclude the current row. So instead of saying the range that unbounded preceding current row, we'll set it to 90 preceding and one preceding. So 90, so this is working of the units of day, so we'll work back 90 days. So subtract 90 days from the current transaction date, so that's according to the column of the order by, and we'll subtract one day from the transaction. So look everything from yesterday to 90 days beforehand. Sounds good, right? But what if I pay some money in today, transfer it to Webby, and she's really quick and transfers it out this afternoon? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We've got away with it, haven't we, Abby? It sounds great. <laughs> oh. um, so we want to be a bit more granular. Rather than look just yesterday, we want to look you know, a bit more recent, um, so let's say past minute. We could down, go down to the second maybe. Let's just say, has there been another transaction of the same value within the house from the minute before back to the previous 90 days? If there is, then um, we say, well, something a bit suspicious going on here. Let's look into it and um, see what we we'll pull it out or we'll tag it as fraud. Now, note, so this looks at the simple scenario where I'm transferring just to Abby. I said we could kind of infer if we, I pass that money to all of you and we're all involved in this big chain. Well, we could change that max to account. We can see that this same value is being transferred around. And, well, we can say that a lot of people are making a transaction of the same value. A bit fishy, right? Particularly if it's a large, you know, thousand euro plus transaction. Doesn't happen very often. I mean, we don't know exactly that it's all going from and to each other. But we can say we want to look into this a bit further. So we've got our rules. Pull out the 10 million um, euro transactions and find has there been another transaction of the same value in the same house. Right? OK, so. So come on then, Chris. This all sounds amazing. Your sequel's doing some great work. Just how good were you? <sighs> well, uh, I'm... Uh, uh, I'm I'm feeling good about this, right? I'm feeling okay, confident. Okay, okay, come on then. All right, let's look at this. So first thing I want to remember, so like I said, we've got a little over 100,000 transactions here. Um, and we're looking back historically based on what was tagged as fraud. And matching up what my our rules said versus what the bank said, we found an error rate of about 1%. So we're getting about 1% of them wrong. Yeah, sounds pretty good, right? Right? That's not bad. <laughs> You're kind of like, mm, sure. <laughs> we're all right. Well, the fraud rate is also about 1%. Ah, okay. So it's sounding better, right? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We must have done it. I think I think we've done it. Yeah. You think you've done it? Okay, then. Okay. So, okay. Okay. so have we done this fraud? You're not convinced yet, I could say. But all right, yeah. then. Well, let, let's just see. Let's see. Let's find out which house has the most transactions according to these rules. And it's, well, we've got a whole bunch with no house at the top. There's, there's probably those wildlings and it's the Night's Watch. That's, it must be uh, it, the Night's Watch in league with yeah. the wildlings, right? Up, up who knows what they get up to? What do they get up, in that, up to on that wall? I don't know, but it's clearly something dodgy, right? <laughs> yep, 100%. 100% dodgy. Okay, so let's get him. Let's get, let's Pull in John Snow and um, pull him in for questioning because clearly they're up to no good, right? Sounds great, Chris. Um, uh, got a small problem. We're is? still losing money. Really? Still losing oh. money, mate. Uh oh. Uh -oh. And uh -oh. by the way, the Baratheons aren't happy with those new rules you've put in because now we're stopping all of their transactions because of your rules. So we're still losing money and we're upsetting our customers. Uh, so well, hang on, what? So we're still losing. People are still committing fraud, and but some these innocent Baratheons are, are getting pissed off with us or upset with us. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. it. So come on, Chris, what's going on? What's going on? All right. Um, okay. I think I think we need to dig into this a bit more detail. Before we do, a, a bit of background, a bit of theory. Now, <laughs> Before we go into this, <laughs> worth pointing out, we did put this example together a very long time ago before current events um, hit. Um, that said, it turns out to be actually quite appropriate for current events, and perhaps you'll see why. You let's imagine you're feeling you're feeling not very well. I mean, I hope 
all of you at home are actually feeling very well. I'm going to make this very clear. <laughs> Hope you're all perfectly safe and healthy. But let's, in this hypothetical world, you're not feeling very well. Um, your leg's really sore, and you're worried you've got legs falling off itis. You've gone to the doctor about this and said, you know, they've run a whole bunch of tests on you, and it's come back true. You know, you've got this really rare legs falling off itis disease, um, and so this isn't good, right? Now, thing is, this is a really rare disease, so it affects maybe one in 10,000 people. So not many people are going to catch it. And the test itself is also really accurate. So 99-ish, roughly, percent accurate, about as good as you're going to get for most scientific tests. Hmm, how, you know, at this point, how are we feeling? How are we feeling about this? What do you think, Gabby? I'm, I'm terrified at this point. <laughs> Well, you've got a really accurate test, so I'm, I'm quite happy about that. And to be fair, only one in 10,000 people get legs falling off itis. So I'm mm -hmm. maybe not too bad right now. But come on, I've got a feeling that you're about to educate me. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd be pretty scared at this point. But let's, let's break it down and look at actual numbers or map this to real numbers. Let's imagine we've got a population of 1 million. In that population of 1 million, we are going to have 1 in 10,000 of them are going to be actually have this disease. Um, so about 100 people, or and we'll stick with exactly 100 people, keep the numbers nice and precise for this one. Um, the vast majority of people are going to be perfectly healthy. So of those sick people, 100 of them, they're all going to get this test, and 100 of them is going to come back and say that they are in fact sick. So it's going to correctly tell them they've got the got legs falling off itis. There is one really, really unlucky person, you know, who's going to be told they're healthy when they're not. They're going to get a negative result here, um, and you know that's that's a really bad day, right? One in a million chance of this happening to you, but it, it can happen and it does happen. Um, so oh, that's not good for that person. But let's look at the healthy people. So we can see the vast majority of healthy people get the correct diagnosis, so 989 odd thousand. But 1% of those are going to get the incorrect diagnosis and be told that they are sick when in fact they are perfectly healthy. That is nearly 10,000 people. So if we look at the people who've been told they're sick, regardless of whether or not they are actually sick, well, you're about 100 times more likely to be in this healthy group than in that sick group. Um, so now we've looked at this, well, hopefully you're feeling a little bit more assured about it. You're shaking, 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 every shape. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. Um, so let's, what, what have I just talked about here? Because this is throwing some numbers. This is an important machine learning thing, isn't it? It is. In data science, when we're looking at machine learning, we really want to look at how accurately the machine learning model has performed. So jokingly, we ask you how accurately you've done. An accuracy score is one way of saying how well you've done with your SQL rules. A confusion matrix, which you've just walked us through, is a more detailed way to look at the accuracy of a machine learning model or accuracy of SQL rules. And it gives a business a better understanding of how we've got to the answers we've got to. So when you look at a confusion matrix, you have true positive, so that's where we got it right, true negative, so where we said it's negative and it really is negative. Then we've got false positive. So where it is fraud, but we've said it's not fraud. So we've got it wrong. And then we've got where it isn't fraud, but we've said it is fraud. And depending where you are in the business, you'll be really interested to know whether you want to be high or low in the false positive or the false negative. So instead of just looking at an accuracy score, we need to drill into those numbers a bit further with something like a confusion matrix. Mm, yeah, so it's it, so this is really important, and I think you know the hypothetical disease example we just looked at. It, it is really uh, <laughs> important at the moment because there's lots of people being tested for. I'm sure you know what, um, and not all those tests are hugely accurate. So you know. This is a, it, it, this isn't an example. Well, I, we did kind of make those numbers up, but it it is a real problem that not just fraud, but um, in health 
people in healthcare need to deal with. So they need to know these true and false positives. So let's look at how our rules actually did. So we had an error rate of uh, 1% and a fraud rate of 1%. Now there's a blindingly easy way to get these two numbers to be similar, or in fact, exactly the same, to get the fraud rate to exactly match the error rate. Um, so let people, you know, unfortunately we can't really get questions from the, or responses from the audience here. No. I say, I think, I'm sure someone watching this has spotted it though. There's a very trivial way to do this. And we can just say, everything's not fraud, right? So we've got our error rate to match our fraud rate, but actually we haven't, you know, done anything. We've just let everything through. Um, not very good. So what we want to do is build our confusion matrix for our SQL rules. So they said, we've got a little over 100,000 transactions, and we look at our true positives, just uh, about 80 of them. And that's, that's looking right low, right? That's, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty low. <laughs> that's pretty low. Um, and a lot of um, true negatives, So, which is kind of what we expect. Let's look at the other numbers. So if we look at the uh, false, Positive, false, hang on, let me get this one right. <laughs> oh, no, sure. The um, false negatives, that's it. So the people who were told they weren't actually committing fraud, but were. So there's 1,200 of those, um, 1,200 you know, fraudulent transactions, which were flagged, passed through absolutely fine. So if you are committing fraud in, under this rule system, you're about 15 times more likely to get away with it than actually be caught. Hmm. Okay, maybe my oh rules my. aren't good here. <laughs> um, and looking at the uh, false negatives as well, again, you're about 10 times more likely to be in the false negative camp than the false positive. So overall, I haven't really done very well here, have I? <laughs> have I? Well, so. it explains why the Bar Baratheons are upset because they've fallen in the pot of the 872. Yeah. And we can see why we're now losing all the money still because, well, you've got 1200 that you completely missed. So at least we understand now why the SQL rules aren't actually working. So that's good yeah. to know. Okay, well, okay, thanks. But Go on then, teacher, help us. How can we do better here? Go on then, Abby. Okay, so let's have a look at machine learning. So the biggest difference in machine learning is that we have two types. We have supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Supervised is where we've been given or augmented with some labels. And in this case, the hand of the king has gone through and said whether it's fraud or not fraud. So we're going to be working in a supervised area. Lots of times in the fraud world, you don't have those labels and it's no labels, you're gonna go into the unsupervised. It's a little bit trickier, so we'll maybe park that for another day. So let's stick in the supervised learning world. So in Chris's world, he looked at all the columns on the left-hand side of this table. So the dates, the tra transaction types and senders, and he wrote some rules. So it's 10 million and which houses are working together. In my world, essentially, I'm looking at the fraud column, the augmented column, and saying that this is what I know. Dear machine, please could you find the patterns for me? So I don't have to find the patterns. The machine's going to find the patterns for me. So then we pass it on into the next stage. So what we need to do for machine learning is split the data into train data or test data. And that's so that the when we actually get to applying this, we can actually, you know, not overtrain the model. So train data, we can split it 80, 20. And there's a great example of this in the database. You can do a sample and then 80, and it will take 80% of the data and put it into the train. And if you add the seed function, it enables repeatability later on. And then if you want to create 20% test data, the database can help you again with a minus function and put the other 20% into the test data. So now we're ready to actually do our machine learning. So to do your machine learning in the database, so big thing here, um, if any of you have spoken to Charlie Berger Oracle, his big mantra is don't move the algorithms, uh, move the data, move the algorithms. So the algorithms come to the database and we leave the data in the database. So staying inside the database, we're going to create a model settings table. And in the model settings table, we're, today we're going to use the um, naive Bayes algorithm. So we say insert into model settings table, algo name, 
algo naive. And we're also going to add into there a prep auto. So what this will do is if you've got null values in there, it'll handle them for you. If you've got any exceptions, it'll handle you for you. So it takes a lot of the hard work away from the data scientist. Great. So now we've got our settings, we best create a model. And thankfully, DBMS data mining functions are going to help us out. So again, not much coding from my side. If we then create a model, it looks like this. So we have a model name. So in this one, it's GOT fraud model. We're going to use the function classification. So classification is going to be one or zero. So we're classifying data. We're going to use the table name train because that's the one we just created, the R80% to train. The unique ID in this case is the transaction ID. And the target column is our augmented column fraud. And we're going to use the settings table that we've just created called model settings. Press go and off it goes. Press go. Wow. OK, it seems pretty good. <laughs> It was pretty quick, wasn't it, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> so once we've got that, we want to apply what it's learnt onto our test data to see how well it does. So we use the DBMS apply and we say use the model G GOT fraud model, the transaction test table this time. Again, the case ID is transaction ID and we're going to ask it to put all of its results into the fraud results table. Okay, all right. So that, that, that's pretty easy, right? So we just inserted a couple of rows, ran a couple of functions, and we're data scientists now? We're, we're data scientists. Oh, oh okay. hang on, we need all to right. analyze this, though. We need to analyze it. All right, okay, okay. All right, let's see. Let's find out how we did then. Let's find out how we did. Ah, <laughs> so uh, hang on, hang on. a rate of 3%. Uh, uh, hang on, I thought this was going to be better than mine, right? I thought this was gonna, supposed to be better. Yeah, but <laughs> okay, true. But hang on a second. As we did with yours, when we drilled into the numbers and we did the confusion matrix, yours wasn't so great, Chris. Okay, so fine. shall we um, shall we All create right. our confusion matrix? Okay, okay. Then so uh, so we just call a we got procedure for that as well. Then I take it. Yeah, we've got a new we've got a function in there. DBMS has got another function: compute confusion matrix. So instead of having to write SQL, I can ask the database to do it for me. Thank so you, if we follow this through, we can ask for accuracy. We're going to send it the results table and the test table. The unique columns, transaction ID, the target column is fraud, and we're just going to ask it to create the confusion matrix. Okay, so, so let's look, let's see, let's look. Okay, so we've got this, mm, okay. Okay, <laughs> come on, I got, I got quite well at Detecting the fraud, 832, not too bad. Mm, okay, and, uh, yeah. And on my case, you know, you're 0. 0.5, but I'm going to miss you. Yeah, okay. So we're, we're about twice as likely to catch someone as they can get away with it. Um, okay, all right, okay. You've so, done much better uh, there, I'll okay. Hang on, hang on. Hang on, let's look at this. The, those um, yeah. false negatives. False <laughs> so I am going to be still annoying the Baratheons quite a lot all right okay um okay but we're catching more people right or at least less fewer people are getting away with it substantially fewer, fewer people, people are, getting, are getting, away yeah. getting away with it all right then um so let's figure out let's find out who these positive transactions are um, go on then so yeah got... i'll hand over to you to do some sql then yeah all right time to time to write some sql again let's get get our hands dirty um so we've got a table uh, after spitting out all these procedures we've run we've got a table where we've got the transaction ID prediction one or zero was it fraud or not and the probability so for each transaction we want to pull out the prediction the one or zero which of those rows had the highest probability lots of ways you can do this what I'm going to do is sort the rows or um, number the rows one and two sorted by probability do it using row number so for each transaction sort by the probability descending that will give us one or two. And of course, we want the row with the highest probability. Um, so we need to find those where it's one. We can then feed that into our table, apply that to the transaction table, join it to see what's going on. And let's let's see who's, who's the baddies now. Oh, <gasps> Lannisters. Right, get them in. Get them get in for question. It had to be, it had to be, didn't it? Well, I'm not sure we can get them in at the moment. Maybe we just have to freeze their accounts or something. <laughs> Very yeah. true, yeah. Okay. All right then. 
So seems pretty good, but we've still got some errors. So I reckon that we can do a bit better here by combining your ideas with my ideas to get an even better result. What do you think? I, I think that sounds like a good, I think that's a good approach. So we can kind of iteratively do this then. Yeah, and in the world of data science, we call this the CRISPM, or one approach to this is the CRISPM, so the Cross Industry Standard Approach to Data Mining. And it's an iterative model where you understand, you apply, and then you learn very quickly and, and reapply. So we're going to add the SQL rules with the machine learning, and we're going to save the seven kingdoms. Fantastic. Sounds perfect. Brilliant. All right, then. Um, so it, what we'll do to this case, in this case, we're going to take the, I'm not sure whether you call it pessimistic or optimistic, but what we want to do is we really, really want to catch people who are having fraudulent transactions. So whether rules mark it as fraud or whether machine learning marks it as fraud, we're going to say it's fraud, tag it, and investigate those transactions. So if either of them have a fraud flag, we will pull them out. And doing that, we can then build a, a confusion matrix a little bit like this. Now this looked a, a, a little bit like yours, Abby, didn't it? But no, but, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're finding slightly more true positives now. And actually, you're even less likely to get away with it than ever. Um, unfortunately, you're now also substantially more likely to be annoyed and told off that uh, you know you've been committing fraud when in fact you're just perfectly innocent so it's trade-offs right isn't it abby yeah it is it is a trade-off it depends which part of the business you are um very often risk stewards are looking at that bottom left hand corner so the 385 in our case and saying the better we can do there the better for the bank happy times but the other side of the bank that are looking after customer relations and therefore the baratheons are saying well actually by applying all of these rules and machine learning you're really annoying our customers and that's not good for business so it is a bit of a balancing act yeah and i think that's the thing you, without this confusion matrix then the business are kind of in the dark about where they are aren't they they don't know who's being affected by what so if we look at how the different approaches stacked up against you uh, against this i mean clearly the sequel on its own it, caught almost nobody so it was almost useless right <laughs> almost useless mm, but okay. you didn't you didn't really annoy that many customers that's true so from a that's customer true. relation point of view you've probably won with the sequel yeah that's a that's a fair point and you know we're, we're talking about th serious things like fraud but um you might try and use machine learning for other things like um targeting customers for promotions and so on where it probably kind of doesn't matter which bucket they really fall into at least you know you might some customers might be upset about receiving constant you know promotional things and I, and I, I know my bank keeps sending me stuff sign up for this credit card sign up for this mortgage and it's just like just, just go away I'm not I'm not going to do it right <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> exactly but on the flip side if we look at the SQL machine learning and if I was a risk steward for the the seven kingdoms bank then I'd want the SQL machine learning because less frauds getting through and I'm stopping it yeah Okay. So it, it's a bit of a balancing act as to what overall the bank wants to do. Exactly. So I think this confusion matrix is really useful. In terms of our approaches, we talked about SQL rules and machine learning. There's another way we can kind of think about this. We could call it, rather than SQL rules machine learning, we call it deterministic and probabilistic. So the deterministic is our um, SQL rules approach. What we basically got is someone in the business has drawn up this big list of rules. You know, someone has been the hand of the king and gone through. If these criteria are hit, then we'll tag it as fraud. If these are criteria, and we can have this big long list. Um, and it's, it's just code crunching this, really. You've got to sit through, someone comes up with the rules, defines what they are, and you crank out what they are. So, Sounds pretty straightforward, and it's something we are all familiar with um, as developers in IT, right? But your world's a bit different, isn't it, Abby? Yeah, so my world's more probabilistic. So essentially, I have a sliding scale from zero to 100. And zero could be really good, and 100 is really good, but just how close to 100 is certain, and how close to zero is impossible. And then the question becomes almost certain? nearly impossible and where the business draws its line on where that 
probability line lies to say that something is definitely fraud or not can be a bit of a journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's certainly the grey becomes a lot more grey as you get closer to the 50% line, doesn't it? It's just like, well, how how certain do you have to be to kind of tag it? So, yeah, it's it's a different world. It's a very different world. So let's let's kind of um, recap and compare. Do a side by side thing. Finish up. All right. So. As I said, with SQL rules, the thing here is we're deterministic. Now, actually, I, one thing I would say is I've said it's deterministic. This is in terms of the rules we've applied. Actually, I think we all live in Abby's world where it's a bit probabilistic. We fool ourselves into thinking it's deterministic. Um, just because just we've got a rule that says it's fraud doesn't mean it is actually fraud. This is just in terms of how we write our code. Good, big advantage of this is you know, you give any competent programmer a big list of rules and they will be able to do it. You know, I hope they do it with SQL, but it doesn't really matter which language at the end of the day. Every good programmer could give you a big list of rules. You can write a whole bunch of tests on them and make sure that that does what it was, uh, is flagged when you expect it to. And the thing is, there are some situations which are just inherently dodgy, shall we say, and you want to be absolutely certain you always, always flag them as fraud. Personal example, um, sometime last year, I bought a new laptop. Shortly after purchasing that, I logged into my bank and made a large transfer. Turns out it is the first time i would logged into my bank using that la laptop. Some alarm must have gone off with my bank, and I, I'm not sure if it was later that day or the next day, day but shortly after I got you know, one of those phone calls, we've noticed some suspicious activity on your account. Did you really make this transaction? And the thing is, you know, so uh, new uh, device, large transaction, maybe someone's stolen my credentials and are trying to clean me out, trying to clean my account out. Um, and that is something that's just inherently fishy, plus it doesn't happen very often. You know, most of us get a new device maybe once a year at most, possibly even less than that. And again, how often do you make a, a new large transaction? You know, something that's not your rent or mortgage payment. Again, maybe once or twice a year. How often do you do both those together? Very, very rarely. So even if very few of these types of transactions are actually fraudulent, it's probably worth investigating all of them just because they're so rare and the risk is really really high there. Um, so there's some things you always want to flag and you, you can't be sure of that, can you? You can't, you can't no, be sure so you're going to flag that. <laughs> no, mine's more probabilistic. So in your scenario, that might have come out at like 75% probably fraud. Mm. Is that good enough for the business? Would they have flagged that and said, yes, that's definitely fraud or at least fishy and we need to investigate further? So there's going to have to be an element of testing and business understanding in the probabilistic world to be able to apply machine learning appropriately. Slightly yeah. different world. Yeah. Of course, the, the thing is, you've, you've got the big advantage in that um, you don't need the hand of the king to go through and pour through all these transactions and figure out what, what might be what we think could be fraud, right? The, to let the machine figure it out. Yeah. Um, so you need to be told what the rules are to go away and program them. Yeah, exactly. And this is this is something where you really, really need domain knowledge. So another personal example of mine. So 15 odd years ago now, um, back in the early days of online shopping, I had a credit card and they had some kind of pretty simple rules based system where if I spent more than something like 50 pounds online, um, they would it would trigger a fraud check. You know, so they would phone me up. You made this transaction. Was it really you? Thing is, I did this but not every month, but you know, once every couple of months. And I, the first time it happens, you're like, ah, someone stole my credit card. Second time, you're like, okay. Tenth time it happens, you're like, ah, oh, forget it. I'm sure it was me. You know, my wife shared the card as well, so maybe it was her. Maybe she bought something. It's it's a boy who cried wolf problem. If you're alerting people all the time and you're trying to guess things, you might guess things which happen really. You know, if you want to be flagging something with a rule, you want to be sure that either it's rare enough, it's not going to annoy your customers, or it's such a high chance of being fraudulent that, you you know, um, 
it's worth uh, annoying the small number of people who are perfectly innocent in those cases. You need that domain knowledge. You can't just invent it, or it's tough to invent it. Whereas, you know, with you, you. <laughs> Yeah, so I, in my world, like I said, I was concentrating on the fraud column. So I, I was allowing the machine to find the problems, the patterns. And that's great for things that are new. So think cryptocurrency. When that came online, we'd never seen it before. We didn't know how people were going to transact with it or how they were going to spend it or how often, how much. How do you write rules for something you've never seen before? It's a little bit trickier. So something like unsupervised learning models can really help bring to light new information, new patterns that you've never seen before, enabling you to investigate and maybe even come up with laws. Okay, cool. Um, so it's a balancing act, isn't it? Um, it is. But one thing on the like the rules-based approach, and again, I say SQL rules, you could have written them in any programming language. Fact is that for most of us, this is going to be, you know, stuff we understand. Um, so you, as I say, you're given a list of rules, you will find a way to code that up and test it and make sure it all does what it's supposed to do. But it's also from the business perspective, the business are much more clear about understanding that. You know, they say, well, if there's a 10 million um, pound transaction, then we are definitely going to tag it. Whereas people where it's like, well, there's a 90 percent chance we're going to tag it. Uh, you know, they're not quite so comfortable, are they? <laughs> no, but as we did demonstrate today, thankfully the database has some functions to help you do machine learning. So Oracle have actually had machine learning in the database for 18 years. So Oracle 9i was the first machine learning <laughs> algorithm. Not bad going. Um, yeah. But it does mean that you need to learn a few new skills and a few new functions and how to use them. And additionally, I think the biggest learning curve for people stepping away from development in SQL and into the world of data science, data engineering, you know, those kind of world is it's a different approach. It's questioning those numbers and it's really driving through what accuracy means and therefore understanding probabilistic versus deterministic. Okay. Okay. So I, you know, I, I can see a lot of benefits of machine learning and I think, you know, as we said, the blended approach can work quite well, but I, I've got something. I've got something. I need to pull you up on a little bit here, Abby. Um, so the thing, big thing with our rule, our rules, we said we can test them, and that means if we flag the transaction as fraudulent and it gets audited for some reason, you know, the Baratheons say, you know, definitely we're innocent. Why the heck are you flagging it? Well, we know why, right? We just follow through the code and get to, oh yeah, you trip that rule. Okay, we can adjust it or do whatever so that no longer happens. Right? Can you do that, Abby? <laughs> yeah, so this is where the big downside of um, machine learning is, and it's it's having a fully explainable machine learning model, especially things like GDPR, where we need to understand why we've made that decision and why we've applied it to customers going forward. And um, so there is a big area in the world of machine learning about doing fully explainable machine learning models. So depending on how much you need to be able to explain the results that's one thing there is ways and techniques around this so you can run different data sets through it and be able to explain the behavior of the model so we can put lots of fraud like certain types of transactions through the model and see what kind of results it would give us and that starts to explain the model behavior but you're right chris i yield on that one you wouldn't know exactly why it's flagged i might not yeah okay all right then <laughs> so i guess for me and chris what we wanted to bring to you is that machine learning isn't a massive step away from the database and that there is a lot of skills that myself and chris cross over on and that's really good but also the impact of false positive and false negative have to be explained to the business and we have to take them on a journey it's no longer just about accuracy it's about understanding how accurate and then it's a case of are you ready for machine learning are they ready to take that journey from the deterministic world through into the probability world or even just mix and match the worlds together to get an even better result so if there's one thing we want you to take away from this is which one are you ready for good question good question for the audience to end with <laughs> <laughs> all right then and i think that's pretty much us that isn't it that is us, so I guess we'll take any questions if anybody wants to reach out on the chat.